Here we go. All right, welcome back everybody to another great conversation on the TLC. Um, we are welcoming back um, Paula Sappington of Hilton and Jenny Bruckman of Wevo, who are going to continue the conversation that we started a while back uh, about combining quantitative and qualitative research to unlock the power of um, customer-focused decision-making. So I'm going to pass the, uh, the screen share over to Jenny um, and let her take it away because you all have um, a whole bunch of content and you are well known to the crew. So guys. <laughs> Take it away. Awesome. I'll start by asking the question we all get a million times a week. Can you see my screen? Yes, ma'am. Perfect. All right. Um, so just a quick tee up. Uh, we're super excited to chat about this, especially with such a crew that's um, closely aligned to both sides of it. So we're going to talk about research and optimization, really the idea of shifting left to win right. Um, and Paula's got some really great nuggets that bring that to life. Um, you all know us. If you have any questions about who we are and our backgrounds, we're happy to talk about it more. Um, I'll speak for myself real quick and then pass it to Paula because she's got all the slides after this. Uh, I'm Jenny. I've been in A-B testing in um, the space for a long time and uh, I'm now on the Weibo side and um, more platform side trying to figure out uh, how we kind of continue to create the best of solution for research and optimization, but can't ever stop being a tinkerer and practitioner in the space. So love these conversations. Paula, over to you. Thanks, Jenny. Hi, everyone. Um, Paula Sappington. I've been in uh, the research space for about 30 years. Um, I've been at Hilton for a staggering 26 at this point. Um, I started in traditional research at first and then moved over to the digital space about 13 years ago. Um, so you'll hear a lot more about our program today, so I won't spoil it. Um, I will uh, just mention today that I am based in Memphis. So forgive the t-shirt, but I'm repping my city because it's been a rough, raw few weeks for us. So thoughts and prayers. Um, okay. Uh, let's see, Jenny, this is back to you, right? Um, sure. So the um, slides that we put together, Paula and I have talked about this a bit before, so this may feel a little bit more formal for this community. We're certainly happy, as Kelly mentioned, to answer any questions toward the end. It's probably an easier flow if we run through everything, because we'll probably cover a lot of your questions. Um, and so when we think about that, what are we going to run through? Um, we're going to cover the insights landscape as a whole. Uh, both Paula and Kelly and I all felt like we were starting to see it shift and change a lot over the last couple of years. And so um, that brought us together around this idea of uh, the silos that exist today for quant and qual um, and how that kind of came to be and why that is. So we'll anchor on that idea for just a second. Paula's going to walk us through that. And then I'm gonna walk us through some ways that we can now today um, combine quant and qual in different ways uh, to accelerate impact of both. And then Paula's gonna bring it all to life um, with some uh, really cool stuff in the next iteration and really how we think about this big picture idea of shifting left to win right. And I won't um, spoil the, the big idea there any more than that, but um, we're going to cover a whole lot of content. We'll probably get through it in about 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. So with that, um, Paula's going to walk us through this first section. Thanks, Jenny. So um, as, as I um, speak to you, I do think it's useful for you all to hear a little bit about the genesis of our program at Hilton. Um, so just a very quick um, sort of debrief. So we began our optimization or A-B testing practice in 2008 um, with about a half of a dedicated FTE, as many of us um, begin or may still be operating in. Um, we were also lucky enough at the time to have budget for a few large in-depth qualitative studies. Um, so me coming from the traditional research side, I I had a hunch that there was going to be some value in some um, kind of deeper learnings from a qualitative side. So we had the budget to, you know, hire a consultant and come in and do some uh, in-depth interviews, which, uh, which really informed our program. Um, those are incredibly expensive and time consuming, but um, you can really get amazing insights um, from that. So we found that we, you know, we 
we gathered about two years worth of optimizations off of just one, uh, well, off of each study really. Um, in 2016, Hilton formalized as kind of a human-centered design product organization. We had a bit of a, a, a shift around into a, sorry, did somebody say something or was that just an echo? Okay. Um, into a product organization. So we were truly customer led at that point, um, which enabled us to begin hiring UX researchers um, to collect qualitative feedback from customers. So that feedback, feedback, similar to the big studies we had done, would supplement our analytics and our A-B testing results and ultimately inform our roadmap. So currently we have about five uh, dedicated resources on our experimentation um, A-B testing team. We have nine UX researchers and we're continuing to grow. So this team is one combined team. Our um, A-B testing team and our qualitative researchers are all um, part of, of our one department. So um, we really push each other. Um, you know, every day we drive exponential learning. I think um, pairing those thing, two things together gives us a really nice through line that we'll talk about. So um, how and why did we create this, uh, this mashup of, of these two teams? Um, so for, for Hilton, the benefits are super clear in that um, our main focus is on de-risking before we get to the point of launching anything in production, even as an A-B test. So when we think about de-risking, there are two kinds of risks that we can reduce with UX research or qualitative research. There's that value risk, which is like, you know, will they use it? Will they buy it? And then the usability risk, can they use it? Um, so it's one of the most important things we can do really to inform our, our design teams and our product teams. Um, and if we're doing it right, we always have customer feedback before any project begins. And then then that helps, you know, define our roadmap, it helps prioritize the things that we're working on. Um, and then as we're developing, we're putting it in front of customers as often as we can. Um, sometimes it's conceptual, just trying to validate our solutions um, that we've dreamt up. Uh, it might even be, you know, paper prototypes that we're showing people when we're standing in a hotel lobby. Um, and, you know, it becomes more and more high fidelity as we get closer and closer to launching into production. We also um, democratize. So we want to share what we learn um, in an organization really of any size. I think you can share all sorts of learnings um, that assist others. Um, of course, if our work is based on customer feedback, our experiences are just going to be better. So that's kind of another undeniable benefit. Um, but there are challenges too. So, uh, and they're not new, right? We have to do more faster and with fewer resources. So um, shifting to kind of the, the landscape, um, we understand that many, if not most organizations don't have the luxury of resources that I've described in order to do this work, um, much less having them able to exist on the same team. So let's talk a little bit about the siloed situation. So when we think about general industry statistics, um, you know, this is not new to everyone on this call as practitioners, um, but we know that 90% or so of customers want authenticity, right? Some innovative niche companies have given our customers a glimpse at this authentic, personalized experience. Um, and so we're all trying to, you know, to follow that because our customers demand it. But on average, to build something like that, uh, it doesn't happen overnight. It really typically takes anywhere from 12, four to 12 weeks, I think, to, to build something and ship the code. And that's once you know what to build. That's once you have all the requirements and you understand everything you're trying to do. So if you layer insights and feedback into that cycle, it takes a lot longer. And then when you think about, you combine all of that with an average 25-ish percent win rate of A-B testing. So shipping code really is an enormous risk. Um, and that's just when you're testing. Um, it's much more of a risk when you haven't tested into it. Um, and we haven't even talked about the cost of development and QA, et cetera. 
So, so there's a huge upside to great digital experience, um, but a lot of risk as well. So we talked about what customers want and the time it takes and the risk. So let's talk about what we can do to help improve the process. So let's first talk about quant testing. Um, and let me just make a note and say that for the purposes of today, when I'm talking about quant testing and quantitative feedback, I'm really talking about A-B and multivariate testing. Um, this is what I think of as sort of the quant side of research paired with you know um, high sample survey data. Um, but what I'm not referring to is digital analytics, which of course is vital to everything we're talking about is an incredibly important you know, input into all of this. Um, and we can have, as we do, entire sessions on analytics. Um, but for today, um, when I'm talking about quant, I'm really talking about digital A-B testing, optimization, experimentation. Okay, so what does A-B testing tell us? Um, it tells us what users engage with. So when you're running a you know, multivariate test, what variables matter to consumers? Um, you know, which variation should we build? Um, and of course, what data can then support our roadmap and our next tests? So what drives people who think quantitatively? Um, we've all heard, you know, terms of left brain, right brain. So this kind of left brain world of A-B testing, um, you know, fits nicely together. So what makes people like that tick? Um, we think of left brain organizations as the data-driven decision. Um, we need to know what works best. We think in numbers. Um, we rely on analytics platforms. Um, and of course, ultimately, statistical significance is going to rule the day. Um, these are incredibly objective, incredibly valuable bits of information. Um, and when organizations think this way, you know, there's a whole lot of data driven insight, which is invaluable. So how does qualitative fit in? So again, I want to take a minute and pause and explain what I mean when I uh, am talking about qualitative work. So what I'm really describing is actually just simply getting out and talking to your customers. Um, typically, it's called UX research, but really it's just listening for context and thinking about ways to identify mental models. So um, from a kind of definition standpoint, we think about it as a systematic way to investigate users and their requirements. And it helps you add context and, and insight into the process of designing the user experience. So there's a variety of techniques and tools and methodologies you can use, um, but really you're trying to reach conclusions and uncover customer problems. Um, it can be exploratory, it can be generative research, it can be solution validation, and all the way to usability testing of actual prototype screens. Um, I find that it's done best when it's led by trained researchers um, who can ensure that you're really gathering objective feedback um, but in the absence, again, of resources to hire trained researchers, um, any anyone can really do this with some training. Um, it takes a willingness to listen um, and a willingness to learn and also a willingness to have your feelings hurt. <laughs> if you're involved at all in the design or requirements process, um, often, more often than not, we hear that we've gotten something wrong. And that's, again, where the goal is going to be. Um, you as a person who works for your company has become too ensconced in your pro in your product to have the same perspective of your customer. It's just by default, that's how it works. So, um, so it's important to, to, uh, get trained in ways to be as objective as possible. Um, I feel like everyone should be exposed to this kind of information, um, product owners, of course but get your developers involved, get your designers involved and your executives. Um, sometimes this is the most valuable data that your executives will ingest. So even being able to use tools that record, you know, video record, audio record your customers talking about how they feel about your experience. 30 second clips can make an enormous difference in what your executives are thinking about. Okay. So what can this tell us? Um, it helps us identify 
again, what problems are we trying to solve? What should we be focus on, focusing on? Um, where can we reduce friction? Again, what are your customers' expectations? What's their mental model? What are they expecting when they come to your site or your app or your company? Um, and again, how do we inform the roadmap? Okay, so back to the brain. Um, right brain kind of activities, what kind of um, things make this kind of organization tick? So these are people and organizations that wanna hear directly from customers. Um, they think in words, they're convinced by conversations and discussions, and they react to the strength of feelings that you can hear and understand when you're really having deep conversations with customers. Um, these are tracked by special platforms that can enable distribution of learning. Um, again, if you have the resources for that, if not, it, that's okay. Still, you can stand in the line at Starbucks and strike up a conversation and learn things. Um, and really doing this simply helps to understand the why. Um, it's the why behind the data. And that's what's so important. So what happens if we combine the two sides of the brain together? So first of all, you have data um, that you're getting kind of on that left side, but it's supported by verbatims and conversations and feeling that you're hearing from your customers. Um, you can get a reliable signal, um, true statistical significance, um, and data on behaviors that is vital, um, of course, as we test into things. But it also can give you the contextual clarity from your customers to help you really understand the why. Um, you get the marriage of qual and quant. Um, and once you put those together, if the left brain could be considered the provider of KPIs, organizations that think about, think in terms of KPIs. Um, the right brain provides us the KPYs and together they are better. So um, I wanna encourage you all by saying that a test and learn culture is possible even for small companies, if you have the right perspective. Um, at Hilton, we have robust teams of experts, again, both on the quant side, so the A-B testing side, and on the qualitative side, the UX uh, research side. Um, and that enables us to, to put those together every day. Um, later on, at the end of the presentation, I'm gonna show you the actual value and some data behind what that's meant for us. Um, but first, I wanna share a framework with you um, with which you might start approaching your work. So um, as we think about how to gather these learnings, we all know that insights and reliability are incredibly helpful. This is not a surprise. The Y axis here is, is insights. So it's learnings we can gather about context and emotions and expectations. So this is the Y part, W-H-Y part. Um, and then the X axis here is reliability. Um, and if you consider that through an optimization or A-B testing lens, this is the reliable signal we get from high sample size, statistical significance, random controlled trials like A-B testing. So when you are low on insights and reliability, you're working with intuition. Um, you're not really gathering feedback. You kind of have no N, you don't have a sample um, really, or you might have a sample of one or two. Um, you might have the hippo effect where you have an executives or an executive or a group in your organization um, that's really trying to drive um, your direction, but you're not being customer led. So you're in react mode. You don't really have a cohesive strategy. If you begin to add some insights through this UX research qualitative kind of um, gathering of feedback, you can start to understand the customer's mental model. So this is really rich, insightful data that provides really great direction, um, but it's not easy. Um, it's qualitative, so it's a low sample size, it's a low end, which isn't a problem inherently, um, because again, you're just trying to de-risk and get directional feedback. Um, but it can be a challenge uh, for some organizational cultures. Um, leaders often 
the first thing they want to attack is methodology. Um, and so, you know, when you tell them you have a sample of, you know, 12 people that you talk to and you have strong findings from those 12, they're immediately going to jump on low sample size. So another tool in the toolkit to add, of course, is A-B testing through an optimization program. Um, as we all know, uh, random controlled trials are accurate, can allow you to iterate and test and learn in a really precise manner. Um, it's vital to do, we believe, um, before launching into production. Uh, so high end, obviously this is vital. Um, and in those left brain folks in your organization, they can easily buy into this. Um, but again, as we know, there's still plenty of risk and effort involved and you're still shipping code. Um, and when you're living in this quadrant only, on the low end of the Y axis, you're basically deciding what to test in a bit of a vacuum. But if you can combine both, this green quadrant is where the magic happens. So this is where we bring qualitative insights to inform what customer problems to solve, what to spend your time on. Um, and this is, tells you what to A-B test to increase your chances of success. So when you live in this quadrant, um, you use qual to, to de-risk cheaply and nimbly and quickly in order to inform the costly time intensive qual tests in order to increase your win rate. And obviously then that increases your learnings and hopefully your bottom line. So um, as part of this community, uh, this TLC community, you're, you may be siloed and you may be doing some of the high end work um, and you may not have considered doing both. Um, if you're doing both, congratulations, um, you're best in class, I think. Because um, we know this is hard. Um, as I mentioned at Hilton, we're lucky enough to have teams who work on both the high end and the low end, and they come together as part of one department um, in that green quadrant because we all sit on one team. So I'll toss to Jenny now to talk about ways to maximize the impact of doing qual and quant together. You know, it's a good uh, content when it's the I don't know, fourth or fifth time you've done it and you're smiling so much that your AirPods are popping out of your ears. <laughs> so we're, we're at a good spot. Um, awesome. So uh, additional quick bit of background on why I care so much about this. Um, I've been on the agency side and worked with a ton of different enterprise orgs in A-B testing primarily. And over the last couple of years, over the you know last 15 or so years, really in the last couple of years, I've seen the introduction of UX research and qual just explode. Um, so that's just contextually my, my passion and background for this is when I've seen that introduced, the impact is significant. Um, doesn't change the fact that it's really freaking hard. <laughs> um, as Paula said, on both sides of this, it requires a lot. Your organization may or may not have invested enough resources to have enough people to just tackle this. Um, whether they do or they don't, uh, whether it's one person or a team of 10 or 20, it just takes a lot of hours and a lot of expertise. So you got to you know, manually prep um, and thoughtfully craft non-biased research plans each and every time, perform the interviews, review the quotes, review the videos, all incredibly valuable time. But you want to make sure that you're prioritizing that time for the really complex problems where you know that it can add the greatest value and that you're able to really summarize and synthesize meaningful insights out of that investment. So is and always will be enormously valuable and, and vital, um, but really difficult. And as is A-B testing when done right. So uh, you're talking about a multiplier effect typically of, of multiple cross functions on a team for A-B testing. You still have to thoughtfully prepare and craft test plans, design the variations, code the, the prototypes and or, you know, code the experience variations in the testing platform, perform QA, all that good stuff. And then you still have to let it run for a while and summarize those insights. Uh, and then when you're ready to call it, figure out, you know, what the actual data story was. So um, again, is and always will be enormously valuable. I think both of these functions are only becoming more critical for organizations over the next 10 years. 
But when we think about how the heck can we make that easier, uh, that's really where I see the opportunity in the market and um, where hopefully we can provide some solutions to help do that. So whether you're a small team or whether you're a large team, there's benefit of leveraging the scary word that's out there in the market, AI power, but it's human augmented AI. And I think it's really important to call out that humans do some things really well and AI does some things really well. And it's really about how do you bring the best of both together? So when we think about that from the Wevo perspective, we're, we're really focused on there are great tools on both sides of the, the brain and there's this green quadrant in the middle where we can make life a whole lot simpler. So we can make it simpler by uh, helping in that preparation stage. We can expedite the recruitment and simplify the recruitment process for research um, studies so that you don't have to be a super pro or spend the hours necessary for that, as well as standardizing the study design. You want to ensure that there's consistent quality in and quality out. And so much of good UX research has to do with the quality in on the really solid framework and methodology of the study design. So standardizing that helps you then execute. Uh, and there are ways that you can now, because you've standardized that, execute um, in an asynchronous way. So where you may be dependent on the hours and man or woman power available to do it human-led only, you can with AI and a, a consistent standardized framework start to run multiple studies asynchronously and you can infinitely scale in a different way than you could before. And then the last piece is probably um, the most important, honestly, because it, you do all of that work, but you don't uh, make the analysis and the insight gathering easier and more consistent. You're still at risk of uh, low adoption. So if we can automate the analysis, make that much more turnkey and effortless, that's a huge benefit. If we can simplify the data story, so you want there to be a consistent appetite for insights and to create that, you have to uh, deliver consistently valuable data stories. And so you have to get teams used to, executives used to receiving insights in a consistent way. And then you wet their appetite over and over again. And before you know it, they begin asking questions like what insight led to this priority across the team? Um, and then with that, you can now start to streamline and standardize socialization of those insights because teams are ready for the next, you know, nugget uh, that you're, you're passing through that next insight, um, streamlining that socialization becomes a whole lot easier as well. So I just talked about this conceptually. Now let's bring it to life and that's great, but how does this actually work um, since? So uh, we talked about the effort and the, the incredible value of the parts going on on the left side of the screen here. So you, you really want to be able to get to a maturity stage within your program where you can reserve this valuable expertise and effort for the more complex problems. And so then on the everyday insights, so to speak, you can leverage AI power and a tool like Levo and um, methodologies that are standardized and asynchronous study um, opportunities to let all teams across all functions, including UX researchers who need a more efficient way to go do that everyday insight gathering, do this in a more streamlined and standardized way. So it's really low touch and that you just need to say, here's the experience I want to test and here's the audience I want to test it to. And then let the machine and the, the, the Levo uh, process kind of do that heavy lifting in the middle. So what we've understood is there are these consistent steps we can do over and over again that don't need to be reinvented in a reliable way. So we can recruit the panel, matching that target audience criteria, survey the audience in a standardized proven methodology and framework. It's always um, quality in, quality out use AI to analyze the data much more efficiently because we're asking a consistent set of questions in a consistent way across experiences, which by the way, also allows us to start to get into cool stuff like benchmarking and then summarize those takeaways with really thoughtful human pairing with the AI power. And then you've got the ability to spend less time doing the doing and more time uh, you know, doing the review of the results and the insights and figuring out how does this fuel my roadmap? How does this uh, fuel my next research study. What now that we've done the mile wide, do we want to spend our really valuable time going a mile deep? So I just want to give a quick flavor. I'm not going to jump into demo or anything like that, but um, 
want to give a quick flavor of some of the insights that you should look at in a consistent way. Uh, and it's about a holistic approach. So you want to singularly summarize in a consistent way each and every time the dashboard view of what each test taught, taught you and, and told you. So, you know, soup to nuts, here's how effective the experience was. Here were our different lenses of insights uh, at a granular level. Uh, here's what our audience sample size was, which um, we typically do at a much higher sample size of around 120 so that it's a really reliable signal. Then we can benchmark those key diagnostics because we're asking a consistent set of questions across different experiences. And so we're able to say, look, across the industry, first impression typically ranks here as a snapshot in time and your experience did, you know, statistically significantly above or below that or was on par. Um, and then most importantly, with all of these different views, we want to pair the qual. So to Paula's point, you need those verbatims. You need both the data of the quant and the, the why context of the qual. So with all these views, you have thousands of different user quotes and verbatims to unpack and associate them with things like visualized sentiment. So where you see hot spots of likes, you can see exactly where people intentionally clicked and said, I like this. And then most importantly, here's why. Here's my verbatim that helps you understand why I really liked this, why this resonated. Similarly on dislikes, why didn't I like this? Why didn't it resonate with me and what can we change? Um, and so, and we can ask custom questions and you know add some things like that. But the big picture from my perspective is it's gotten more and more important to layer uh, both A-B testing and UX research uh, together for exactly the reasons Paul is gonna bring home in the last section today. But it's really become table stakes that teams need effortless access to, to these insights that they trust and uh, table stakes, especially at the executive levels. Um, more and more often, uh, you, you're hearing and creating the desire to understand what insider data drove a priority. And so as we think about that quadrant that Paula so beautifully laid out, we saw that the big opportunity was in that top right section, right? How do we lean heavier into reliability and heavier into you know, the quality of insight, but in a more effortless way? And that's really where um, we see the, the big opportunity in the market of human augmented AI and a solution like us to be able to deliver that next generation of mile-wide research so that you can make it more effortless, you can keep it equally insightful and equally reliable, if not even more reliable, because of the bigger sample size, so that you can free up resources and spend that time and energy going a mile deeper. And if you don't have resources, it's certainly really nice because then you don't have to think about how do I bring on the headcount that I need to do UX research and optimization when a platform can help you do a bit of, of both. So. Um, again, I come from a practitioner lens. I can't take that hat off. So I wanted to bring this home with how I think about using a tool like Levo in, in concert with A-B testing. And so first and foremost, if I am designing a program, an A-B testing program from scratch and I'm doing it today, it's gonna be a critical part for me because I wanna first and foremost understand the control from a qualitative and quantitative lens. I wanna do really clear and quick and effortless problem validation and discovery so that I can build the best possible roadmap that's based on validated problems. Um, if I can't start with validated problems, then I can't uh, guarantee that there's gonna be impact on the other side of good solutions. So first and foremost, just testing the existing live experience. We can just point to a live URL or a live website journey um, and, and start there. It's really quick and easy. Then the next piece, is we kind of have blinders on a lot to just looking at our experiences, the experiences we own on our own website, our own app, et cetera. But what if we instead took a little bit of a wider view and said, well, what if we wanted to A-B test ourselves against some competitors? Wouldn't it be nice if we could do that? So I like to really encourage that that's a early stage um, exploration as well. So beyond just a heuristic, actually looking at them in a head-to-head -head performance to understand what works well, what doesn't. Let's avoid what doesn't work well in our own experience and incorporate what does. Um, and we can include our own experience in the mix or not, that's up to you, but you can test multiple at the same time, head to head, gather all of that rich qualitative feedback at a really big sample size, and then have those diagnostic lenses with all of the rich verbatims to understand really which of these is better and most importantly, why. 
And then when you bake all that information and insight into building your best possible roadmap and test variation, that's fantastic. But how many times have we all run an A-B test and it comes back flat, which is the most infuriating results in the world? Or uh, it comes back as a loser when everybody swore it would be a winner and you have no clarity into why. Or even better, you have like a really big swing redesign change or, or you're changing multiple variables in one variation because maybe you don't have a lot of traffic or you don't want to spend a lot of time in field or something like that. And again, you want to be able to understand, well, what made the difference, right? What was the why? And so running a test like Weevil alongside gives you all of that why with that predictive layer of this is better or worse alongside an A-B test. So running a research study um, or a Weevo alongside is really going to give you that clarity. And then you take all the insights of that and you go make a better, if you tested A and B against each other, now you go make a much better, you know, iteration C. And it's better because you, you built all of that why understanding and clarity into it. And now you can, again, go retest that to the market and get a fresh new set of understanding around the why. So um, these don't have to exist in individual silos. They can exist uh, in pairings. And sometimes, you know, one or multiple tools may be able to do all of it for you. Um, but certainly in this case, you want to, to use both of those methodologies hand in hand the whole way. And like I said, if I'm starting a program on a brand from scratch, this is the approach um, I'm going to take to make sure my roadmap and my variations are built from a really clear understanding of why. So that ultimately uh, we can do that, that uh, right brain side, that qual side, UX research, um, let them spend that incredibly valuable expertise and energy understanding the why where it's really complex and um, needs that, that really heavy hand. Same thing for A-B testing. You're spending a whole lot of time and energy. Let's put our best bets forward and measure the performance of what we have the greatest confidence in before we even build and code the test variations and create this middle ground that's accessible to a broader set of practitioners across the team so that the expert level practitioners can spend that more valuable time on the more complex problems. There's an available solution to all teams, be it you know UX researchers, strategists, analysts can run their own experiments, product owners, marketers, because it's a standardized and repeatable setup, because it's a really proven framework and methodology, and because you have the reliability of scores and industry benchmarks. So really trying to bring home this idea that we wanna shift left, which Paul is gonna bring to life um, in the next section to ultimately reduce those risks and make every experience a whole lot more effective. So with that, I know we've had a couple of questions and we'll definitely answer them all at the end we're watching. Um, with that, I'll pass it over to Paula, who's going to get into our final section here. Excellent, Jenny. Thank you. OK, so what does it mean if we begin to incorporate both quant and qual into the work every day? So joining the KPIs and the KPYs. So remember our left and right brain um, that quant A-B testing side and the UX research side, how might we begin to think of these differently? So if you shift and start thinking about these as an order of operations, working left to right as we do, um, as most of us um, do, um, let's consider a notion called shifting left. So let's put the quantitative A-B testing um, experimentation side on the right side at the end of our process. And let's learn about our customers first. So let's lead with the qualitative data, put the right brain to work actually on the left side of the process. Um, so when you begin a project or an analysis with qualitative research, um, by really talking to your customer and collecting feedback, you can gain a lot of things, right? You can prioritize your roadmap based on customer priorities as opposed to hippo priorities or other. You can de-risk by learning about perceptions and expectations of designs and UX before you begin to experiment. Um, and you can ask the data to tell you where you should spend your time. Qualitative feedback can really bring that into focus because you can find an A-B test that gives you results, but 
you don't know the veracity of the customer's feelings on that or why they did what they did. You just know the answer. So understanding that why is really helpful. Um, you can develop the strongest test hypotheses. That's kind of a no brainer, right? Once you understand the way customers are thinking, your hypotheses really might shift a little bit. And ultimately, again, you learn what to focus on next. Um, where's the customer telling you to go? So sample of one company um, at Hilton. Um, I know this seems like a really daunting task, um, but uh, from, from, from our sample of our program, um, I can tell you that shifting left will pay off. So when we think about um, the slide we showed earlier about a somewhere around a 25% industry win rate for A-B testing, um, a peek behind the curtain a little bit at Hilton, um, we started uh, before we kind of shifted into this product mindset with UX research, we were running somewhere around a 22% win rate without this user research. Um, then we kind of shifted a bit, we built up and we started really relying on customer feedback, um, using UX UX researchers to help de-risk a little bit. Since we shifted into that uh, mindset and that program, our win rate has jumped up to a little bit above 35%. So for us, that is significant and meaningful and an enormously valuable increase for the company's bottom line. Um, so no, it didn't take us to 100. <laughs> it didn't take us anywhere close, but it took us leaps and bounds over where we had been. Um, so really in summary, um, the idea of shifting left by building up our, our research practice to de-risk ahead of, of time um, informed our testing roadmap. It led to, led to fantastic gains um, for Hilton. So hopefully you can take this a little bit and think about shifting left, be a little more customer driven. Um, it does help you ruthlessly prioritize your roadmaps to focus on your customer. Awesome, thanks ladies. Um, and great timing. So we have uh, just under 15 minutes left for questions. I want to start with John's question, um, which he did go over and post in the TLC calls channel. So I appreciate that. Um, so, but we'll go ahead and ask it live here. So we have it on the recording, but we can also um, respond in the TLC calls later. So we have it recorded twice. Um, for customer feedback, do you think customer service teams offering a survey are a reliable way to get that info or do you think those are going to be skewed towards the negative or is it more based on the questions you're asking? Paula, you want to take that one first and then I have a uh, take on that. Yeah, sure. So I was actually just typing my answer to that. So I'll post it after I answer. Um, Excellent question. I will say that I um, there is absolutely you know questionnaire bias. We all know that it exists. You can skew things wildly depending on how you ask the question, where in the process you ask the question, etc. Um, I think surveys are absolutely fantastic ways of gathering insights. And my first comment would be yes, do this um, where you can in a way that does not interrupt the customer flow. Um, you can even gain qualitative feedback on where to ask the questions and where might you might cause friction uh, by surfacing surveys at certain times. So avoid that. But um, in the absence of doing that, I would say that um, surveys really give you two things. Um, there's trending, obviously, like if you have sort of an always on survey program. Um, it, in my mind, it matters less about whether you're skewing results, but what matters is the trending. If it's the same skewed questionnaire for two years, you're just watching the trending, right? You're focusing less on the actual numbers that you're getting, focus on the trending and are yeah, the things you're doing matter. Scale. If it's a bad scale, you're just watching the trend of the numbers yeah. that you're Yeah, yeah. Um, but more importantly, I would say it almost doesn't matter if you're collecting you know, if you're skewing towards the negative, just go learn from the negative feedback, right? These are customers who might be, you know, excessively upset at some sort of experience you're servicing, but go learn from those. Um, they may not be fully representative of your representative of your customer base, 
but that's okay. Um, they feel passionately enough to leave you survey responses. So go learn from those. I wouldn't, I wouldn't spend 100% of your time just focusing on the problems that they're surfacing, because again, may not be representative. Boy, you can learn some great stuff. Right. And, and if you're only listening to upset customers, you, you want to listen to upset customers, but if you're only listening to upset customers, then what you're not hearing are prospective customers that are enjoying your competitors. So that's yeah. you know, the, the beauty of usability studies of your competitors' websites is you're finding out what's out there that they're looking at outside of your website that you you may not even have available to them. So, you know, consider the possible that you're not providing um, as well. Just a couple of quick thoughts to add to that. Um, we, it's part of why we uh, source a, a separate audience. So we don't use your live traffic. Um, we source a lookalike audience to whatever criteria you provide. So to Kelly's last point, we could source an audience that is purely prospective or purely customer or some combination of both. And then you can drill down into the differences between and it's equally important that we have that quality and quality out proven framework on anywhere on the Wevo side on our methodology of the survey, because we ask things like expectations where we ask purely open-ended that we don't want them to get into selecting from a list or giving them a bias of a predetermined answer. We take a lot of that and look at the aggregate raw data and then pull themes out of that versus trying to pre-theme possible selections and then uh, give them choices accordingly. So um, just a couple of quick thoughts on that. Uh, thank you very much. That, that's super uh, insightful. I just wanna add one more thing. Do you guys think it is worth enticing them to complete a survey? Like, you know, get a coupon or get something like that? Or could that also kind of skew the data? So it's standard for us to use um, incentive to collect feedback. There are some mm -hmm. audiences that are pre-aligned to that. And there are some audiences that um, like if you're just using your own site traffic, for example, um, I think to Paula's point that can, uh, my personal experience is that can sometimes skew feedback for the positive or negative based on the incentive associated, like we're really protective of things like length of survey and things like that, because the quality mm -hmm. feedback falls off a cliff if you get outside of like 15 minutes. Um, mm -hmm. And then they expect a much bigger incentive. Uh, right, so right. You, yeah, you do have to, to balance that, but incentivizing is not uncommon. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. That, that, that was uh, very helpful. So thank you, ladies. Uh, Florent asked, have you encountered cultural issues getting UX researchers and analytics experts to understand each other and collaborate effectively? Um, yes. <laughs> um, I, I, yes, that which is exactly that right brain, left brain scenario. Um, these are folks who think differently. Um, I, I'll I'll just say from, again, sample of one at Hilton, what we learned was we stepped quietly into qualitative feedback by sort of hiring a consultant, going off and doing some, um, some qualitative work and coming back and giving readouts and people saw the value, right? And then we started sort of slowly shifting our A-B testing program or things that the analytics team are, we're diving into um, to be focused on that feedback. And over time, really iteratively learned, everyone started learning how valuable that feedback was. Um, but yes, that can be a challenge. Um, I can't tell you how many times we've pulled up like Nielsen Norman group articles about how, yes, eight people can give you <laughs> a decent enough sample if they are saturated if they all are saying the same thing, you've got a problem. You know, eight people is enough to give you direction on a certain topic. Again, depending on your objective Best and hypothesis. I ever saw for getting quant folks to value wall feedback was when quant folks were hitting their heads against the wall to try to get, you know, people to listen to their quantitative research. Like, oh my gosh, I have all this data that says, need to do this thing and somebody was like no this is my precious baby and I want it to look this way 
And a qualitative researcher went and got three or four people, got their quotes to say, no, you should do what the quantitative research says because, you know, here's my emotions about it. And so they had four customer quotes that agreed with the quantitative data and they were able to use the qual research that supported the quantitative massive amounts of data to get the leadership to do what the quantitative data said. So putting them together gave the weight that was necessary to make a decision. And all of a sudden the quantitative folks understood the power of combining the why with the, the data, the, the KPY with the KPIs. And now all of a sudden they wanted to work together. Um, now, obviously there can be the dark side of that, of only digging into the qualitative data to find, you know, the cherry picking of the qualitative research to find only what supports your research. And you want to be careful of that. But that was a really nice bridge to build, to get them to, to start to at least listen to each other. Yeah, that's why you need as much as you can get objective researchers um, who are trained in order to not skew that data. Um, one thing I will add, there are A-B testing tools out there today um, who enable, as you're running a test, they will enable um, some survey capabilities that can kind of ask just one or two questions to try and gather the why. Um, and that's incredibly valuable. It's the same thing as going out and talking to customers, you know, about here's version A, here's version B, what do you think? Um, and if you can start to get that at scale via your A-B testing platform, um, that's amazing too. So um, as an example, Matt and Nate have uh, developed that at Conductrix and, um, and it's, it's an incredibly valuable way of gathering a little bit of the why at the same time. It's not in depth, it's not deep, but it can give you a really good signal. It doesn't have to be, right? You can get the everything from like task completion to satisfaction to MPS score connected to your A-B test. Yep. Pretty cool. yeah. Yep. Yeah. And that would help with analytics folks thinking, starting yeah. to think that way. And tie those things together. Mm -hmm. um, okay, Jake asked, having the UX and A-B testing folks aligned and working closely, it's huge. Are these two groups in the same team? Um, or in peer teams in the same or larger org, can you shed more light on the org? Are they all in marketing? Uh, many orgs have these groups focusing on different things. So do you have any insights to help get these groups working more in concert? That would be great. Wouldn't it be great? <laughs> I totally agree, Jake. <laughs> more orgs need to be I aligned think... under this customer research uh, mm -hmm. idea that, that uh, Hilton is so lucky to have. How do I we, mean, Hilton said the, the ideal, if just what I've seen over and over again is um, if they can be aligned on the same team, that's the best. If mm -hmm. they can't, let's figure out how they can at least share a goal or a KPI together. And then everybody rows in the same direction. <clears throat> so it's less about immediately trying to swivel the organizational structure and more about, even if it's an additive goal that complements their individual primary goals or KPIs. Um, that's incredibly powerful to creating that. That's a really word synergy over sharing, sharing a goal and a KPI and a focus yeah. on different teams. Yeah. Um, we only have two minutes and I, I really want to get to Matt's question. Uh, Graham, we'll try to get to your question, um, in the TLC Slack, but Matt asked a really good question about panels. Um, Jenny, do you have a, any thoughts about, um, the benefits and issues with panels and how do you sure. deal, you know? Go ahead. So we can, yeah, so we can do bring your own panel if you have a large enough audience, um, which is sometimes leveraged, but uh, oftentimes you're looking for outside panel because that may be a challenge and it's a logistical challenge and you have to incentivize them and all of that. So uh, our perspective early on was um, it's becoming an increasing challenge to uh, build and source your own panels. And so our perspective is we just have a whole lot of panel partnerships in place that give us the variety to be able to say, what's the target audience criteria? Where does that best fit exist? So that we can make sure, um, the other thing that will kill uh, responsiveness and uh, openness to qualitative research is if they can poke holes in the quality of respondent. 
uh, or the fit of respondent. Um, and so we're really, really protective of that. And you just need a huge ocean to fish in in order to be able to find that best fit um, for, uh, for target audience criteria, B2B, B2C across the board. So that's our approach. That's the perspective I would share there. Awesome. Um, well, join us all uh, about one month from today, October 7th, the invite should be coming out um, either into this week or early next week. Uh, part two or three of our conversation with Vista um, will be um, back with Lucas Vermeer um, and joining us, Joshua, uh, Joshua Tankard, Kevin Anderson, and Mauricio Aceball, and they'll be talking about uh, time split testing for pricing and um, uh, uh, testing at Vista and experimentation culture and how they do uh, experimentation testing and experimentation testing, experimentation culture at scale. So come back, see you in a month. And until then, continue the conversation over on the TLC Slack. Bye all. Have a great week. Thanks, Paula. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks, Kelly.